Greg, it's been years since I've seen your face. What a pleasure it's been to not see my face for a long time. And I'm very sorry that you have to see my face. You remember like right before the pandemic, we were supposed to do a show on Earth Day and it never happened. Were we? Yeah. 2020. Earth Day 2020? We were supposed to do a show. Well, the Earth revolt. The Earth yeah, said the Earth no. fought back. <laughs> yeah, the Earth fought back. Episode 2020, the Earth strikes back. And everyone was like, oh, I really wanted to see them live, which is a mistake. Well, guess what? <laughs> you know, it's Earth Day all over oh. again. Only this time it is May 20th. Is that Earth Day? No, I don't think so. Feels like Earth Day. Sure. I, it's Earth Day now. Yeah. I, Welcome to Earth Day. <laughs> if there's even an Earth left on May... It might be the end of Earth Day, yeah. May 20th. Who knows? But on May 20th at 7 p.m., uh, we will be part of a live show that is a few L.A. podcasts and us. It's going to be L.A. Not So Confidential and Great Holly podcast. Weird Paranormal. Fantastic people. And us. What is he going to say about us? They're there. They'll show up. <laughs> oh, the guys who ruined Earth Day 2020? If for no other reason, it's going to be at the Heritage Square Museum inside of the old Lincoln Street Church. It's going to be in the church. Oh, wow. Okay. As all of our shows should be. It'll be like that scene in The Omen where they're trying to take Damien to like a christening or something. And he's in the car and he's like freaking out as they get closer. Is there like a synagogue we could <laughs> maybe have my section of the show in? But we'll, we'll be part of that show, which I'm really looking forward to. It's been a while since we've done anything live. So look forward to that. Yeah. Unless another pandemic starts by then. But we'll be covering. It's going to be a specific LA crime. And uh, I, w I don't have too many details. I don't want to give away way too many details. Yes. Some I don't know, some I don't want to know. Well, don't want to give. And afterwards, there's also going to be a haunted tour of the grounds That's guided cool. by Hollyweird Paranormal. So if you go to linktree.com slash LA Meekly pod, that's L-I-N-K-T-R-E-E, -E, like those things they have on Earth Day, yeah. <laughs> uh, dot com slash LA Meekly pod, you can get your tickets. That's May 20th at 7 p.m. A podcast of Los Angeles Bonanza. Bonanza. A link tree is a tree that has a bunch of sausages hanging from it. Bonanza. <laughs> Don't tell my dog what to do. He was looking at my water bottle. That's it, collective water. <laughs> oh, because it's in your bottle. I own water now. You make me sick. You and your capitalist ideas about water. You haven't been letting him drink out of my bottle every time I go to the bathroom, have you? <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Is that why my water tastes like sausages? <laughs> It wouldn't surprise me if no, that wasn't the reason. Oh, wait, I'm the reason it smells like snossages. <laughs> Snossage eater, snossage thyself. Am I right? First off, everybody, welcome to LA Meekly. Welcome, this is the show. This is it. This is us. Unfiltered. Yeah. I like my snossage water. Unafraid. But I'm Daniel Zafrin. I'm Greg Gonzalez. And this is LA Meekly, the show. It is a Los Angeles history podcast. Could you believe it? I could believe that you knocked over your foam right now. Um, Don't tell people. Don't, First, you bring on, up my snossage water. Okay, so let's bring up the white elephant in the room, <laughs> your chubby little dog. <laughs> He's not chubby, he just got a haircut. He looked like a budget Muppet before, and now he looks like a real dog. Now he, look, now he looks like a name brand Mark Muppet. <laughs> yeah, he looks, he looks like something that Miss Piggy would have. <laughs> She would wear him. She'd wear him, yeah. But, some sort of boa thing. Yeah, Ringo the dog, beloved L.A. Meekly icon, is yeah. sitting in with us. Asleep on a pile of your clothes. He refused to sleep in the bed you brought for him, yeah. which is his bed, and he instead loves me so much, he's sitting on my recording bag and my jacket. He's been simping for you so hard since he got here. And I'm like, oh, I told him, like, make sure that, you know, you say hi to Daniel, okay? And now he won't. <laughs> Are you going to the bathroom? Are you, where are you going now? Where are you going now? And he lives in his your problem. Now. He's driving me to the airport later. <laughs> Did you know that? Helping load the bags. <laughs> Flying the plane. Flying right? the plane. <laughs> he took classes last summer. <laughs> uh, flying lessons on Zoom through the pandemic. He's well, got most of it done. If you're going to take flying lessons, you want to be on Zoom, don't you? <laughs> so again, this is a Los Angeles history podcast. Yeah, oh, are you after sure? We've been talking about your dog driving me to the airport for five <laughs> minutes. First, we'll talk about um, some local stuff. We're going to then talk about some Los Angeles history. Yes. But before we get into any of that, we actually have some new patrons no to patrons. welcome. No patrons. That surprises me very much. Huh. 
Weird. Greg's something, let me put it in terms people can understand. Greg's something of a simp for corporations. He doesn't, <laughs> few, he doesn't value his own work. He thinks he shouldn't get paid for it. He thinks it's a, just an honor to serve a boss. Yeah, yeah. I think it's fantastic to just like answer to somebody, <laughs> especially like a, a, a nameless, faceless corporation. It's just yeah. like a gray building on the black. I love just giving Which them my... We, this podcast is brought to you by Blackwater. <laughs> <laughs> this podcast is brought to you by a new government that's ruled pretty much by Nestle. Atlantis was found and Nestle yeah. <laughs> Nestle owns it now. But this month we are welcoming in as a new patron Steve Oriana. Welcome Steve Oriana and Chris Williams. Chris Williams, welcome aboard. You're going to be getting po- both of you are beginning postcards from us. I thought you were going to say you're both getting Pokemon cards from you, us. Do you have any by the way, do you have any Pokemon cards? Well, look, off the air Greg Yes, <laughs> a lot of them. A lot of them. I sold most of them. I remember. Yeah, I made a pretty penny. You did, and I thought you were going to be a lot more heartbroken about that. I'm very curious about the ones you kept and why you have kept them. I kept, well, okay. I this is really near and dear to my heart, but I kept all the ones that weren't valuable, <laughs> <laughs> which is why I keep you around. Um, I tried selling you yeah. to Blackwater. <laughs> They wouldn't take you. But look, you too, uh, if you want to support us on Patreon, you could go to patreon.com slash LA Meekly for as little as $5 a month. You will get a handwritten postcard just like Chris and Steve will, yeah. written by us from a different place in LA each month. Or you could join just for $1 a month. You don't get anything. Well, actually, well, you do get something. Let me not what jump ahead of myself. But for $1 a month, here, this is a good way to put it that I heard. You, when you go to a bar, and I know you do, mm-hmm. <laughs> you get a drink. And think of us as a tall glass of, I don't know, what do you order at a bar? Lemonade with like grenadine in it? I order champagne. Thousand dollar champagne every time I go. When you you head into Cheers, yeah, they I all say your name Cheers, yeah. and you say, pop the champagne, my good yeah. Sam. And they're like, what are you celebrating? That I showed up, Cliff, that I'm here. <laughs> what? Well, you want some sort of conspiracy theory about why I'm drinking champagne? <laughs> so you go to a bar, you get a drink and you know, you leave a tip, you leave a dollar or two. Think of it that way. If you, if you have the money, first yeah. of all, and if you like the show, think of it as a little tip a little every tip. episode. And if everybody, it would literally change a lot of things for us. Yeah. It would help us uh, do a lot more with the show, but enough about what it does for us. Any level, $1 or $5, you will get a sticker mm-hmm. of our logo sent to you as a thank you for joining. Yep. And you can put that sticker anywhere. We don't even check. No. You've told me to disable the tracking devices on each <laughs> sticker just because I wanted to make sure it was going on somebody's uh, trapper keeper. Yes. I was going to say keeper trapper. Keeper trapper. But that's what I do up in Alaska. Yeah. So yeah, that's patreon.com slash Ellie Meekly and uh, we appreciate your support. But anyway, let's yes. it, the way it, it, please, we, we've please. almost breezed right past this, Greg. Today is a very special day of the year for us. April 1st. It's April 1st. The beginning of tax month. <laughs> <laughs> As on April first, I just like to come out and say I'm such a big fan of this podcast, uh-huh. and uh-huh. I think it's uh-huh. flawless. Uh-huh. Well, guess what? It's April first. Um, <laughs> I don't love you, <laughs> April Fools. I love you, <laughs> <laughs> April Fools. That didn't hurt me. But before we talk about April, yes, let's talk about what we did in March. What did you do in March? In the city slash county of Los Angeles. I've mostly gone to work and cried. But I told I, you, Greg is a simp for, I love, for big business. I love big business so much. If I'm going to be offering- and you to, cannot lie. <laughs> especially on this uh, holiest of days. Yeah, everything we say today is yeah. mm, uh, dubious. Today is like a class clown Christmas. I'm going to offer something to people to try in the following month or whenever they need it. And as you always say, the first taste is free. You first always tell free. me that. Yeah, and I'm usually talking about- I have no idea because I'm done riffing. Um, <laughs> I've capped out on, on this riffing. of all days. You're done riffing. You're done Greg? riffing. Well, okay. I hey. guess we're moving on to the Pratt Falls. <laughs> April Fools. Um, oh, oh my god, god he got, got me! me. <laughs> I've been t- taking public transportation for the last I want to say month. And anybody who's very curious about taking the bus instead of driving around, MTA has a great a function of their website called the MTA Trip Planner. You put in your address where you want to go, and if you have to arrive by a certain time or leave by a certain time, and it'll plan the whole trip for you. And it's very nice. It's very helpful. It's been helping me for years but I haven't needed it for a very long time. Is this an April Fool? No, this is a this is an April King. <laughs> it's an April Ace is Wild. <laughs> I, this is what I've been doing for the last month. This is basically going to work, uh, taking the bus, which is extraordinarily long ride for me. That is helpful because I hate taking buses, not just because of like buses, yeah, buses, but like whenever I'm in a city that I'm not familiar with and I have to take the, I try as hard as possible to not take the bus because it's impossible. You, There's no like, they're not going to stop 
where you want to go unless you let them know that's where you want to go. And I don't know where I want to go because I'm on a bus in a strange city. Sure, sure, sure. It's pretty hard in a strange city to learn real quick. Like, oh, that was the street a mile ago that I should have got. I hate being on the bus. Oh, that's the fire hydrant I'm looking for? Oh, no. Now I have to go to the Capitol building. I don't think there's a worse. There's plenty of worse feelings, but one of the most anxious (laughs) times. Name one. I get very anxious when I'm on uh, like a new bus or a new mode of travel, like a train or something, and actively keeping an eye out for when it's time to get off, trying to be prepared ahead of time and worrying the whole time if you've passed it or not, (laughs) even though you're diligently watching every stop. But at least with a train, it stops everywhere. They're not like, nobody's going to St. Louis. Boom. Figure it out next time. (laughs) This is a a muscle train. (laughs) Vroom, vroom, vroom. April Fools. They put a Hemi in it. Um, yeah, I should have got it off and cracked in. Uh, yeah, no. So MTA trip planners made it very easy. I, I'm not wondering about what bus gets me where. It'll tell me, like, take this bus at this time. It'll. It's like in the Matrix when he's answer, He's on the phone with Morpheus. He's like, make a left now. Go straight. <laughs> like that's the, <laughs> yeah. If you're looking for, to do that. And, and they do provide that service they, to you. They do. Well, they will. You have to pay for the phone call, but they will provide the service. If you're going on a date with somebody, they'll also tell you what to say on yeah, the date. Yeah, they also provide that service too. Metro's for lovers. Lovers of crack. Um, yeah, so it's helped me a lot. So that's what I've been doing. That's, that is helpful. That's way better than trying to figure out timetables and like the old paper. Things yeah. And looking at and it's, it's also better than guessing. Uh, <laughs> I think in high school, a lot of the time I was just kind of like, eh, that's going that way, right? I mean, at a certain point on a bus, you literally are just like, oh, that's the bakery. Like, my yeah. next, that's my next stop. Yeah. So, but you can't do that when... In this economy, <laughs> this economy stopping a in bakery? a bakery. There's no ba- uh, what, what is it? <laughs> Which Chipotle do I pass by? <laughs> Which? <laughs> oh no, I got off on the wrong Zanku. Oh no, <laughs> I should have made a left turn at Tender Greens. <laughs> That's my reboot of Bugs Bunny. It's pretty good. Well, you want to hear my thing of the month? Yes. It's not a bus, but <laughs> it's a bus you could eat. My thing is a place that I wasn't intending to go here. We we went to that, you know, for the Valley video that we mm-hmm. made, the hit viral sensation, rocketed us to stardom. Uh, we have too many pools now because of that video, but um, <laughs> we went to that Plaza del Valley in Panorama City. Uh-huh. We walked through that. That's where we intended to go. And it was cool. We yeah. liked that. But we then saw across the street the Valley Indoor Swap Meet sure. in Panorama City. And that's what I want to talk about. Wow. Okay. Because I had a great time in I the Valley that, Indoor Swap Meet. That is your scene. It really is. Yeah. In particular, I mean, they had like a bunch of food there that looked pretty good. There's a lot of stores that like, if you're looking for Bath and Body Works things that yeah. are being uh, resold illegally, maybe good for yeah, you. Good but for you. what really did it for me was they had two stores that had every single Mexican candy you could imagine. Oh, like interesting. an unbelievable yeah. display of candy and oh. like bulk individuals, like everything you would want. Yeah. That's sugar from Mexico. Yeah. This is where you go. And that was one thing. And then they also had this leather store, <laughs> which we like, the stuff was so cool. They had like, so it was, I say a leather store, it was and more it, of a leather daddy store. Is there another kind of leather store? Yeah, go ahead. It, it was mostly cowboy boots. Oh, okay, And cool. the boots, some of them were so beautiful, yeah. like so cool looking yeah. that we both were like, do we need to buy cowboy boots? Unfortunately, the answer is yes. <laughs> and if you'll look down a little <laughs> bit, <laughs> April Fool's, I kick you in the yeah. face. <laughs> you know, I thought I heard spurs this whole time. <laughs> I thought I heard the sound of crocodile skin <laughs> rubbing against itself. But yeah, they had really, like really cool cowboy boots Busty. and just a lot of, you know, a lot of stuff is just like swap meet stuff, like clothes and whatever. But like those two things, there are a few other things, but like those two stores were so cool yeah. that uh, that's my thing. Though. The Valley Indoor Swap Meet in Panorama fascinating. City. Fascinating. I think it's more fascinating that it, food was only a small part of this. Well, we had already eaten. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, and they had the Jurassic Park video game. Anyway, so that that's where I was. Cool. But now let's talk about April. Yes, please. Now we did. What? How many years ago was this? Like two, three, one. Um, well, three years ago was twenty twenty, so it wasn't then. <laughs> was it Earth Day? <laughs> I want to say five years ago. No, was it that long ago? Should I look it up. Nah, I want to say it was hey, five to six years ago. Let us know on social media. Let us know how long ago I covered the Thunderbirds. <laughs> yeah. We, so we did this once a junk drawer episode mm-hmm. of just random topics that didn't quite fit into other episodes yes. themes. And we thought, well, spring is here. Love is in the air. Bees in the honey. Mm-hmm. and Cats in the cradle. Cats in the cradle. <laughs> hey, diddle diddle. <laughs> the cat somehow got out of 
the cradle and jumped over the moon. I don't know. I don't really know animals. But we figured for spring, let's clear out the old L.A. Mm-hmm. Meekly junk spring drawer cleaning. and do another uh, junk drawer of just random things that we didn't know when we would cover them in yeah. another thing and we wanted to do it. I, I was looking forward to having another chance to do one of these episodes. And then I, uh, you know, a day to research said, oh, never mind. Uh, Ringo, a moment. A moment, please. Ringo, your owner is blowing it. <laughs> Ringo actually woke up for that. He, he did. He's a little concerned about your work ethic. Having such a good sleep, too. He was freaking out most of the time before yeah. we started recording. And then the second I said, okay, it's time to do it, suddenly the dog is the more professional one of you two. <laughs> suddenly. He's always been professional. <laughs> well, we're going to start with me. Okay. And it's great because I forgot what you're covering. So yeah, I'm like, right. oh, I get to learn something. So, sure, we're all attracted to rattlesnakes. <laughs> now, imagine if one was blonde. Hachi Wowie. I'm going to be talking about the blonde rattlesnake, aka Burma Arlene Adams Nay White. Hell so yeah. So do you know about this? Do you know who this is? A little you heard bit. It? You, you, you heard this, this? You heard this? this? Some you heard this? this one. A little bit. I remember it was covered briefly in a crime thing, if I'm going to It is a crime thing. I'll yeah. give you that. I won't say too much, but it is a crime thing. I, I think I've loosely covered it and never looked too much into it. It might have been like an Aggie Underwood. Aggie Underwood is going to make an appearance. Then I know it from her book, yeah. Uh, Well, guess what, Aggie Underwood? (laughs) There's a new female hotshot reporter in town. (laughs) Burma Arlene White. Three flawless names. So she was born January 9th, 1914 in Ohio before her family made the big, but let's face it, lateral move of moving to the Ohio of Southern California Orange County. Oh, boy. Poor decision-making from the get-go. And thank you to our Ohio listeners for donating on Patreon. (laughs) Thank you for our Orange County listeners for trying real hard. (laughs) They can't figure out the internet. (laughs) So she was from Santa Ana in particular. Okay, I like Santa Ana. Not from, but that's where she was. Yes, they landed in Santa Ana. They landed in Santa Ana. Or some might say Santa Ana landed on them. (laughs) She grew up in a pretty stable, loving, typical Orange County home whatever that means. Uh, let, let you interpret that as you will. <laughs> her teachers said she was a good girl, uh-huh. loves her mama, loves Jesus and America too. She's a good girl. And I'm sure someday she would have been crazy about that guy whose song about episode 109 I perfected. Just that sort of girl who I'm sure would have loved Elvis. I'm, uh, I'm having a real hard time paying attention to facts now. <laughs> why? Because I threw a Tom Petty reference that turned into an Elvis reference. So keep up. Keep up. Are they still in Ohio? <laughs> Where the rock and roll Hall of Fame is, Greg. <laughs> Can you see? Can you not follow the thread? But so when she was 14, she was riding her bike uh-huh. and got hit by a car Yikes. and had to have brain surgery. And according to some, she wasn't quite the same afterwards. Yeah, that'll do it to you. <laughs> Getting brain surgery in the, what, the, the 20s? Yeah, well, did they even have brains back then? But after high school, she started working in beauty salons and moved up to San Francisco to start a beauty career. And then the first big one hit. The Long Beach earthquake happened oh, right. on March 10th, 1933, and facing a situation where she could have lost her entire family, she realized she wanted to be there for them, so she moved back to Southern California to be near them and help support them with her beauty salon jobs, right. especially because her sister was sick and they needed help paying for her hospital bills. Uh-huh. She moved in with a friend and lived at 236 South Coronado near MacArthur Park, Sure, going around being 19 with big blue eyes, platinum blonde hair, and red lipstick, and doing people's Hair. In dream. movie city <laughs> <laughs> in MacArthur Park, Le- looking like Gene Harlow, and uh, I lost it. It fell away from me. Go ahead, April Fools. April Fools. I don't. Know. But for every beauty, mm-hmm. there is a beast. Greg, oh, no. enter Tom White, born July twenty first, eighteen ninety seven, in New York. As white as his name, <laughs> he, which is white. How white is he? Tom White. He and his siblings were a bunch of army brats moving around the country wherever his dad was stationed. At a very young age, both his mom and one of his sisters died, and after that, he started getting into trouble. So much trouble that he was shipped off to a reform school in Colorado to straighten him out. It didn't work. When he graduated, he started getting into more serious adult trouble and was in and out of Colorado jails for various robberies before he decided he also wanted to be closer to his remaining family and moved to LA to be with his dad and remaining sister at one 406 West 10th and got right back up to his old tricks. He started getting arrested for various robberies and public drunkenness before he was shipped off to San Quentin. There he got into a fight where he almost disemboweled somebody wow, before okay. getting his own eye gouged out. Ah, oh my God. Which is a, a disemboweling for the face. 
I guess they both these people had brain or brain yeah, adjacent. That's trauma. I mean, first date. Uh, that's something to talk about on the first date. He pops his eye out. Yeah, check this out. She takes her skull off, and she's like, "Oh yeah, you know what? The eyes are the guts of the face. You're right. <laughs> You're absolutely right. What is the eye if not the tripe of, <laughs> of the soul?" So for his safety, he was then transferred to Folsom, <laughs> where people go just to get glass eyes. Yeah. Is that a Johnny Cash reference? Kind of. Now I've got Tom Waits. Not Tom Waits. Did I say Tom, Tom Petty, Elvis, and Johnny Cash? I've got them all. You've got them all. God. I've got the million dollar quartet. <laughs> oh, I've got almost the traveling Warburys. <laughs> almost. Wait till I get to the part about Jeff Lynn. Yeah. Me to the part of, oh boy, I can't wait to throw Jeff Lynn on this. I guess you didn't pick up on it. I've been making Jeff Lynn references this entire time. <laughs> and this fuck will turn you to stone. <laughs> Am I right, Bruce? <laughs> Bruce, he was released from prison in April 1933 when he moved back to LA where his family was. And now both the Beauty and the Beast, or rather Beauty Salon employee and the Beast, sure. uh, he's still just a beast, are both in LA. Just two months later, both Tom and Burma happened to be at Sebastian's Cotton Club in Culver City. And for whatever reason, this 19-year-old blonde bombshell fell immediately in love with this 28-year-old thug with a glass eye. And so began one of the worst relationships in Los Angeles history. Cool. It's good when you see that start. Because at least like, you know, at least Bonnie left Clyde, you know? Did she? Yeah, they loved each other. Oh, they, they would, well, I thought you said left. I was no, like, no, I no, guess they, they both left each they other. They loved each other. They left a lot of things all at once. Like <laughs> they left the beautiful paint job of that car. Think of the car. Were you thinking about the bullets when you robbed all those banks? What of the bullets? <laughs> Didn't you know there's a bullet shortage? <laughs> we have plenty bankers. <laughs> Now, Tom claimed he was a stockbroker, but most people saw through that and nobody was too happy about this relationship. I love somebody from Folsom with one eye being like, I'm a stockbroker. Oh, okay. I work on Wall Street, <laughs> as in I climbed over a wall and ran down the street. So it's not even entirely clear if Burma was happy with this relationship. Which, by the way, Burma, what? That's a... That's not a name. <laughs> this is part of the my warm-up material for the live show. Burma? Burma. I mean, what? More like Myanmar. <laughs> uh, uh, April oh. Fools. <laughs> I'll be saying that on Earth Day, which is May 20th. Yeah. By late July of that year, uh, just a month after they had met, Tom and Burma were not only partners in bed, but partners in crime. Oh, no, that's worse. <laughs> and embarked on one of the most L.A. crime sprees you've ever heard of. Okay. They did your typical street crime stuff of stealing cars, robbing people at gunpoint, and holding up some gas stations at grocery stores. Cool. Blah, blah, blah. The typical stuff when people... St honeymoon stage stuff. We all have robbed a liquor store in a honeymoon phase. With love in our eyes. Yeah. <laughs> With love in our eyes and PCP in our veins. <laughs> they robbed a Safeway at 3126 West. 10th and followed a guy into his building at 227 Southwestern. But what was really LA about what they did was that the majority of their crimes were car based, not like stealing cars, but like they would drive around in their Gram 8, which was like the Bonnie and Clyde, like your yeah. 1930s gangster car. And they'd both be wearing horn rimmed sunglasses and they'd pull up to you at a stoplight with Burma driving. And then Tom would get out of the car, hold you up at gunpoint before the light would change and then drive off. Wow. This is very much... Um Gun crazy. So the one thing all these victims recalled from these encounters was being distracted by the by the look of the striking blonde woman. Did you get a good look at the guy? No, but the dame va va vu. Uh, 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 and then she looked like this, and it's like Jessica Rabbit. All of the like police sketches after they were done, they're like, uh, "Can I can keep I that? Keep can that? I take that home and like take it to war with me?" We asked for a police sketch. How come they're all in centerfold? <laughs> Do you recognize this woman? No. <laughs> but like every single person was like looking at this platinum blonde. Yeah. And meanwhile, this glass eyed man like shoved a gun in their yeah. face. And then they all remembered that when they'd speed off, this woman was always laughing hysterically. They all like all of the victims yeah. had the same story. The LAPD dubbed Tom the rattlesnake bandit and Burma became known as the blonde rattlesnake. The blonde rattlesnake. Mrs. Rattlesnake. <laughs> Sounds like Harley Quinn. Uh, it's kind of it really was sort of like a, a Joker Harley what are their names? What are their names? Uh, the comic, the uh, was, the Popeye and uh, Harley <laughs> Quinn, whatever they're called. I don't, I don't read funny papers. It's like Ant Man and the Wasp or whatever. <laughs> it was all bad what they were doing, but up until a certain point, nobody got hurt. Yeah. Other than terrifying, yeah. Up to a certain point. Up to a certain point. And that point was a knife. <laughs> that point came 
on August 16th, mm. 1933. An elementary school Whoa, teacher- they met in 33 and by August we're doing this? I told, this was like two months after they met. Like Jesus. they were committing crimes already to get, I mean- I assumed that they were spaced out more, I guess. I didn't know they were still in 1933. No, no, no. This was a whirlwind romance. Cool. Uh, I mean, as any couples counselor will tell you, you gotta commit crimes together <laughs> <laughs> right off the bat. Right off the bat. So August 16th, an elementary school teacher named Cora Withington was taking a driving lesson from a guy named Crombie Allen when they had the misfortune of stopping at a light at 3rd and Lafayette Park Place near mm. the original Tommy's. Yeah. Just as a gram eight full of rattlesnakes pulled up to them. Yeesh. Tom got out of the car, went up to the driver's window, put his gun to Cora Withington's head and said, shell out, sweetheart. And that goes for you too, Bo. I don't know what Bo is, but he meant Crombie. But B E A U? No, B O. <laughs> April Fools, Greg. Yeah. <laughs> Take a shower. <laughs> Sorry, Ringo. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, he heard the word shower and he yeah, uh, he flinched. So Crombie, a.k.a. Bo, sure. handed over $18 and his watch, but Cora's purse got stuck on her skirt. And in that moment of hesitation, Tom pulled the trigger oh on Cora's God. head. The bullet went through side of her head, both of her eyes, oh. and out the other side into Crombie's neck. And Tom and Burma went speeding off with her laughing all the way. Wow, that's horrible. Their crime spree lasted about six weeks and got them a whopping $220 from around 10 stick-ups total. Well, you say that, but... No, For I did the calculations. Inflation, that's $100,000. <laughs> I don't even think it's that much. Like, it's... I think it was like $30,000. Like, it was It was not a life-changing amount of no, money. No, no, no. Supposedly, seven of these 10 stick-ups happened in one evening. Oh, my God. Their relationship solidified by crime and violence. Tom and Burma got married on September 1st, wow. much to the chagrin of everybody who was there, even though nobody knew that they were the notorious rattlesnake bandits. They still just like, I hate just these Just on two. principle, yeah. yeah. Not going to last. <laughs> this match made in heaven would last a mighty five days. Wow. Their marriage. Unluckily for them, and extremely lucky for the two people that they shot in the car, both Cora and Crombie survived. Whoa. Cora was permanently blinded. Uh -huh. Just as miraculously as them surviving, though, Crombie, with a bullet in his neck, somehow managed to memorize the license plate number of the car as it sped Astounding. Off. He passed this information along to the police who were now on the lookout and shortly after the beautiful wedding, spotted this car parked in front of the Casa Del Monte apartments at 236 Coronado Street, which means they were committing most of these crimes within like blocks of where they were Jesus. living. <laughs> the cops scoped out the building for a couple days dressed as mechanics to make sure this was them. And then came September 6th. They were just like the Mario brothers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They had the mustache. Oh, let me let me go downstairs and check on this. And then do, 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 do. <laughs> It's a me, the cops. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Chucks, it's the cops. And he starts like hopping away. <laughs> on. <laughs> he almost got away, but I jumped on him. He's smushed. <laughs> <laughs> He's trying to hop over like turtles on MacArthur Park. So they saw Tom and Burma go into the building and the cops followed them in. When they met Tom in the hallway, they announced it's a me, the cops. <laughs> to which Tom responded by immediately pulling out his gun and shooting at them. Cool. Not something Bowser would ever do. <laughs> Tom was quickly shot dead by the cops wow. while Burma ran upstairs to jump out a window, but the cops caught her before she could. The crime spree was over, but at this point, this story was national news and it wasn't going to end quietly. Keep in mind that the Burma and Tom crime wave was going on at the same time as the Bonnie and Clyde rampage. Oh, I didn't think about and that. And just as John Dillinger and his girlfriend's whole thing was beginning. So yeah. this being the Bonnie and Clyde story of Los Angeles, it got a lot of attention both in the press, sure. but also from City Hall. The Los Angeles DA was a guy named Burren Fitz. Yeah, we've talked about Burren Fitz. What, what we, I, it sounds familiar. I Who, don't remember. <laughs> I think he was crooked. I think oh, he was taking money. I know that much. Yeah, I, I mean, any any DA of... <laughs> yeah, I said he was in City Hall. <laughs> <laughs> so he was working with Burren Fitz, the LA DA, was working with Chief of Police Jim Two Gun Davis mm -hmm. and Mayor Frank Shaw. Yep. That's the three. <laughs> three guys hellbent on ridding the city of crimes that they themselves were committing. Uh, hey, we got to get rid of all this crime we're not committing. <laughs> Let's just keep it the crimes we are committing. By any means necessary, while also positioning themselves for better government jobs. And a high profile case like this to make an example of was a great opportunity to sure. make people think that they want zero crime in Los Angeles. It's, ha -ha. Uh, April uh, Fools. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately for Burma, she would be the example that they wanted. And with... Tom dead, she was going to have to shoulder all the charges that were really mostly on Tom. She was a, a laughing charge. Yeah. 
uh, driving while sexy. Yeah. <laughs> but she was a confusing case both for the court and for the press because nobody could really figure out why she, the pretty young girl from the suburbs, had gone along with any of this. It was the depression, uh-huh. sure. And people, <laughs> what I tell people when I have depression, yeah, sure. That, that's how I react to you. Yeah, sure. Cool, sure. Keep working for me, <laughs> nameless corporation. You simp. <laughs> so it was the depression, and people were struggling and needed money, but it didn't seem like Burma was in that dire of straits. Sure. Tom was physically abusive towards her, and she claimed that he forced her to go along with all of this. But all the victims, again, saw her laughing and having the time of her life. I'm a nervous laugher. Yeah. I'm a nervous laugh. I get. I laugh when I'm nervous. I always laugh when I rob people at gunpoint. <laughs> I, I can't help it. It makes it's, me nervous. It's on my dating profile. You should have known. <laughs> it's a tick. Had something changed into her after her brain surgery, or was Tom drugging her to make her do what he wanted? Oh. Like people thought she. A lot of people thought she was on drugs because of her behavior, and also like toxic relationship as it was. Did Burma have feelings for Tom at all? Like reporters that were there when she was caught said she didn't even care that she was like stepping over Tom's dead body. <laughs> As she was being arrested, nobody knew what to make of her. Yeah. The best they came up with was that she was a, quote, thrill girl who just did it for the thrill of hurting people. Like a psychopath, like a sure, sociopath. Sure, sure, sure. Then she would just be hurting everybody. It wouldn't have to be attached to, uh, we got to rob them. Then I get to hurt them. It would. She would just be hurting people. I maybe, mean, I, maybe I don't know anything. I maybe. mean, maybe not physically hurting people, but oh, like the, the, the financial, you know, sure. bringing misfortune upon people. Maybe. I don't know. We don't know. We don't know. So Burma was convicted of 20 felonies, including six <laughs> robberies, three assaults, and one attempted robbery. And driving, laughing while speeding away. Laughing while speeding, driving while blonde. Yeah. <laughs> um, on November 7th, 1933, Judge Flynn. Fletcher Bowren sentenced Burma to 30 years in prison, saying the number of young people who commit serious crimes is appalling. She was sent to San Quentin before being switched to the Tehachapi Speaking. Women's Prison, yeah. while Fitz, Two Gun Davis, and Mayor Shaw had a big ceremony for the LAPD officers who captured them and secured a bunch of federal money for the city to fight crime. Wow. Since Tom had been an unregistered felon, this money was used to create a database of felons in the city of Los Angeles wow. that I think is still around. Wow, that's interesting. Uh, more impor- informed people will have to tell me whether I'm lying or not about that <laughs> is still being around. But yeah, this is where it came from. That's fascinating. They also used uh, some of its money to buy radios for the cars in the sheriff's department. Cool. So they can say awful things to each other over the radio. (laughs) Now we don't have to use pigeons. (laughs) Bowron went on to be mayor himself. Mm -hmm. Shaw went on to be recalled from office. Uh And Fitz went on to be convicted of perjury by a grand jury. And Two Gun Davis went on to keep being Two Gun Davis. Yes, for as long as they'd let him be Two Gun Davis. (laughs) Meanwhile, up in Tehachapi, Burma spent her time styling the hair of such fellow (laughs) inmates as Clara, the Tiger Woman Phillips, yep. who murdered her husband's mistress with a hammer. Yep. Erna Janoshek, who was a babysitter who murdered a baby. Didn't know and that. serial killer Louise Pete. Beautiful hair. All of them. All of them look great. <laughs> it's like a fashion show. <laughs> and here, straight off of killing a baby. <laughs> um, but look at that perm. Uh, in 1935, she was actually interviewed by Aggie Underwood as mm. part of a story on the women in this prison. And she later wrote an open letter to women everywhere titled Crime Never Pays. Subtitle, a crocodile to your story. She was released after just eight years on December 1st, 1941 and moved to San Francisco where she became the office manager of the guy who created Century City and eventually moved to Washington and died of alcoholism in 1962, or as some call it, the Orange County Retirement Plan. (laughs) Her biggest crime is helping create Century City. (laughs) Oh, that's fascinating. Thank you for covering that. That was yeah, really cool. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome, the city of Los Angeles. Yeah, that's uh, Burma White. She was our Bonnie. Yeah. Every every city needs a Bonnie. Yeah. Every city needs a Harley Quinn type where you can be like, Jesus, don't be like her. Can, is she really going out with him? <laughs> do, 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 do. Um, <laughs> so what do you have to tell me about? Very recently. What, is it? What, 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 what have you been trying to tell me? What are you trying to say to I me? I think very recently we talked about, I covered Charles Bukowski. Right. The writer, alcoholic, womanizer, a sleaze bag. And then I think... Keep going. He's, there's a few more. Last episode, I believe, was the punk venue. So I covered yeah. The Mask, which was where punk a lot of the punk characters would meet in Hollywood. And it sort of put me on a path to talk about something I've sort of been interested in and finally had the reason to research. I'm going to be talking about what is known as the Venice West beat generation scene that happened in Venice, California. Okay. This is something I'm completely on. Un- when you told me this, I was like, oh, the freak show. But like, that, that's not that's beat. Not, 
<laughs> that's it's, not beat. It's just the first thing I thought of in Venice. I like that you're you're so square. Your idea of a freak show is just like people playing bongos <laughs> and reading bad poetry. <laughs> Can you believe this freak? And it's Allen Ginsberg <laughs> reading Howl. Not wearing any shoes. I'm a freak. Get a job. So as long listeners of this show might know, Venice Beach has had a long and weird past. It was once yeah. the marshy and swampy dump and would have <laughs> it would have remained so if Abbott Kitty hadn't won it. I don't know why they changed the name. <laughs> it would have stayed that way if he hadn't won a coin toss and selected the dump over the picturesque Santa Monica. Right. His dream for Dagobah, California was to create a postcard dreamland here on the West Coast. He turned the marshes into canals where people would take gondola rides. He designed amusement piers and boardwalks. You can go to the beach in Santa Monica or Palos Verdes, but only in Venice could you walk into a dream. Right. It was like pre Disneyland, sort of like you're in a fantasy area right yeah. now. There's alligators. Yeah. The alligators are loose. <laughs> <laughs> this area drew in a different crowd, creatives and dreamers. But of course, history happened. Oil was discovered nearby and nightmare steel towers robbed Venice of the view. The amusement piers either burned down or just were left to decay because of like the ocean air just right. decayed everything, basically. The canals were unloved and became filthy puddles of wet trash. The area became sketchy, riddled with crime and homelessness. Even now, I often and say if you want to see someone in the middle of being arrested head over to the venice boardwalk and you'll see someone in the middle of being arrested but nevertheless the creatives still found venice to be a homing beacon for other like-minded weirdos too shaky for santa monica so that's just quick sum up for anybody who doesn't know too much about it's, venice it's los angeles's greenwich village <laughs> cafe wa ba young west coast bob dylan got his start here unfortunately it was donovan um <laughs> Meanwhile, post-war America was spitting up a new literary style that young hip people thought was cool, daddy-o, but had normal people thinking, this is bad. This writing is indulgent and misogynistic. Jack Kerouac, Allen Ginsberg, William Burroughs, Gregory Corso, Gary Snyder would be poets and writers who would be at the forefront of the bebop jazz-inspired coffee house infesting beat generation. They rejected the traditional forms of pretty much everything. American culture, capitalism, writing, literary formalities, romantic relationships. They were radically new in a way that shocked older generations. And while I do enjoy most of what the beats are about, they seem to think women are playthings and the whole movement spawned hippies and pop folk music. So those are some unforgivable acts that were committed. You don't like pop folk? You don't like the mamas and the papas? You don't like the birds? No. Um, Tell me this is an April Fool. <laughs> so there was two established base camps. On the East Coast, the Beats thrived at Greenwich Village. On the West Coast, North Beach in San Francisco was the Beat scene. And that was kind of the two home bases. Right. Southern California was left, being seen as the home of wealthy Hollywood elites and dreamland. So nobody really cared. It was like, put aside. How can a young new culture exists in such a phony place. I bet they don't even read books in Los Angeles. <laughs> I'd love it if I could say, oh yeah, but the Venice beat scene of the late 50s was pretty vapid and amounted to almost nothing. <laughs> because by the time the Venice West scene had developed, the B generation hype had reached its parody stage by the time our scene started to come into fruition. Okay, so we were like the incense and peppermints of kind beef. of. Poetry? <laughs> kind of, yeah. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> Poet, jazz, freewheeling characters had worked their way into popular culture. So you'd see white poets dressed like Dizzy Gillespie, the beret and the goatee. You'd see them in TV shows or movies or comic strips or cartoons. It became like an archetype. Beatniks became shorthand for pretentious, starving artists with their own shorthand slang and dress style. The true beats had moved on from that scene they created and the posers took their place. This happened just as the West Coast beat scene woke up. <laughs> as we say all the time, you want to be the first or the, or the third. third. You yeah. don't want to be <laughs> this scene is very the second. Yeah. What would the third? There, there's the original beat poets, the Venice beat scene. Who? What is the third that perfected it? I mean, Kurt if, Cobain. If you go logically, time wise, it would be the hippies that took over the Sunset Strip kind of thing, like hippies oh, yeah. in Los Angeles. Yeah. If you ask me, true beatnik stuff ends up going to the mask and being punk. Okay. That's what I think anyways. So it's the stinkies and the- The stinkies and, and the, the, the bum bums. Bites. Yeah, the cacas <laughs> and the bum bums. Um, just baby words. <laughs> so let's talk about the two Venice Beach beat establishments and the characters who helped put them together. The first place that opened up was on the Venice Boardwalk itself at 1501 Ocean Walk Boulevard, and it was called The Gas House, a very beatnik coffee house name. The Gas House was led by Eric- It's now a marijuana shop. It's now, yeah. It's coming to itself now. <laughs> <laughs> the prophecy yeah, foretold. Full yeah, come full circle. <laughs> hey, man, someday they're going to sell marijuana it's here. Be legal, man. Our beat poets were Cheech and Chong. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, be beatniks generation. whatever you want as long as they don't have a job and they do drugs it's just a beatnik sounds like Cheech and Chong to me <laughs> so the gas house was pretty much led by a guy named Eric Nord not opened or operated by but kind of just led like Nord was the mascot of sorts for the gas house Eric 
quote unquote big daddy Nord was a fixture of the North beach beat scene as the owner of the coexistent bagel shop, which what it, <laughs> uh, it, it, okay, this is in North Beach in San Francisco. Okay. The bagel shop he ran was called the Coexistence Bagel Shop, and it called itself the Gateway to Beatland. So already, <laughs> it's like if you're advertising it, then there's no way that it's cool or real. Try this onion chive cream cheese, man. It'll p- unlock your mind. It, it's like listening to Charlie Parker when you're eating this bagel. <laughs> What's in the middle, man? <laughs> I don't know. You're giving too hippie. You, you have to be more pretentious than that. That's true. Galileo. That's true. Plato. Yeah. bagel <laughs> and then somebody's just like playing bongos like uh. that's true i guess i i guess i can't do a beat nick and then they're all screaming at women <laughs> they're doing heroin and screaming at women <laughs> eric nord was born henry hilmuth pastor in germany and came to the u.s in 1936 which is a pretty good time to come to the u.s mm-hmm. from yeah, germany if you're a spy <laughs> he was an actor and kind of poet and was dubbed the king of north beach by san francisco columnist herb kane who also came up with a term Beatnik. Nord was the quintessential non-artistic beatnik hipster. He was a large dude, like 6'8", 300 pounds, bushy beard, wearing an old sea captain's hat and riding a tricycle through town, wearing sandals and shorts. I think you might be describing Jigsaw. (laughs) (laughs) He liked to play games. He hated society. (laughs) I wish I knew anything more about I know. I'm I'm, I'm sitting here trying to be like, oh, God. There was like uh, eight of him. Like he's in a toilet. In one of them, they built a statue to him. He has cancer, I think. Oh, God, there's a lady. Is I know he- I saw the poster for that new movie, and I thought, you maniacs, you blew it up. You blow up the franchise. <laughs> Nord ran a series of coffee shops and clubs that became beat hangout spots in North Beach. The biggest one being the nightclub, The Hungry Eye. Eye oh, yeah, is in. Yeah, that's oh. still there. Yeah, it opened in 1950. He sold it to Enrico. You think, I, you think I don't know my hippie clubs, my beat hippie clubs? You got Cafe Wa in New York. You got The Hungry Eye. You got, uh, what were the other ones? I don't remember. <laughs> and I'll tell you, I got food poisoning at every one of them. <laughs> yeah, food poisoning from the whole poetry. <laughs> My body's registering this poem as poison. I got food poisoning from the poetry and the rotten clams I ate. <laughs> <laughs> and that gray egg salad sandwich. Uh, he sold the Hungry Eye to Enrico Banducci and it became a stand-up club where Bill Cosby and Mort Saul got started. Yeah, that's why I know it. I, yeah. know, I know it because all of these old... Because co- I... You know how closely I follow Bill Cosby's career. <laughs> <laughs> Up to like 2012, yeah. I followed his career pretty good. And I kind of, I don't know. Lost interest. It lost me. Yeah. It took a weird Qu- turn. Quite suddenly lost interest for no particular reason. <laughs> Why? How come? Jump the shark. And by the way, 1950 is very early in the history of the beat movement. I can't even think of like on the road and how aren't published till much later in the decade. So by 1950, Kerouac is working on his first novel, Still Town and City. So I don't know how there's a beat movement in 1950 if they haven't done Howl or On the Road yet. But according to the LA Times article about Eric Nord in 1950, he was running all these clubs. So a pre, prolific. A pre-beat. This was the like count in yeah. for the beat. This was the opening act. Yeah. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Down here in Los Angeles now, or it's down here, along with the money from a hip young lawyer named Alphonse Matthews, who I couldn't find anything about. What do you, what do you need to know? He's hip young lawyer. Yeah, hip young hip, hip, lawyer. Hip young lawyer, Alphonse Matthew. <laughs> That's the name of his firm. Hip young lawyer. Welcome to HYL. <laughs> hip and young and lawyer. <laughs> hip and young and law. <laughs> Be next at law. So along with Alphonse Matthews, Big Daddy Nord found a space at Market Street and Ocean Front Walk. Is, this is still San Francisco. No, no, this is down oh, here. Oh, okay. This is down here now. Nord and Matthews open up the space. Well, I'll get to who the third person is later. I, I mean, the three of them found a space at Market Street and Ocean Front Walk. The building the space was attached to was old. It was either built in 1904 or 18. 18- 89. I read both and both kind of make sense in the history of Venice. 89. So I, I read both those dates in LA Times. The space had first been a fashionable drugstore, then it became a sprawling bar with 20 bartenders, which makes me think it was one of those long bars we kept joking God, about. These long bars. Long bars. After that, a it, bartender every four feet. Great in COVID. <laughs> this would have been great in COVID. <laughs> after that, after the long bar, it was a bingo parlor. And then finally, the Venice area went full grime and the space went, we just became like a homeless wino hideaway. Is this where they put the freak show? <laughs> yeah, this is where they put the freak show. And it like homeless wino hideaway. Now it's a homeless wino coffee shop. <laughs> That's about the time that Matthews and Big Daddy Nord found it. I read all kinds of dates, but I'm going to go with my gut and believing this space was, they opened up the gas house in 1959, two years after On the Road was released and four years after Howl. The gas house was envisioned as an art commune, an art center where artists could live and work and display their work. And and enjoy the peaceful atmosphere of Venice. And for three years, that's basically what it was. It was a community center for beatniks. But it was more than just an art collective 
Art gallery, yes. Living quarters, flop house for artists, yes. Community center, yes. But also members only coffee house and stage space. Members so it was kind of like coffee house. Yeah, I guess that's like bad if, for business. That's really bad for. Do the beatniks not care about business all of a sudden? How do they feel about capitalism? <laughs> Uh, hey, one Frappuccino, hold the subsidizing, am I right? <laughs> but can I get oat milk? Um, <laughs> the gas house was where Ali Beatniks would go see poetry readings, folk music, jazz, and have lengthy, pretentious conversations on philosophy and literature. Also, bongos, bongos, bongos. <laughs> and for three years, it really... That was my nightclub, bongos, 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 bongos. bongos. Yeah. We, we played steel drums. It was a lot of actually banjos. <laughs> bonjos, 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 bonjos. No, that was my other club. Bonjos, <laughs> bonjos, bonjos. And for three years, it really was the scene for the West Coast Beats. The small space would be full of a hundred or so being like sipping coffee and creating art or performing. The scene also had tourists, reporters, photographers, and beatnik posers sleeping on the beach and praying to the atheist god to graduate to hanger on. One day I hope to be a hanger on, but for now I'm just a beatnik sleeping on the beach outside of a coffee shop where I sometimes read poetry. What do they ha- well, uh, hang on to? What? The dying beat scene? Yeah. <laughs> so what, who wasn't having a hip daddy old cool cat time was the neighbors who heard one too many bongo jazz all-nighters and decided it was time. Hey. If this was going to continue... Hey. I've been there. Nope. <laughs> You're part of the problem, Square. <laughs> if this was going to continue, the gas house would need an entertainment license, which the neighbors knew they could not get. They were, in fact, denied the license after a public hearing where beatniks and folk musicians with guitars failed to sway the city council. Nord and Matthews continued running the gas house business as usual, permit or not, and they were eventually fined and given one year probation and 30 days. They suspended a jail term for that. After the gas house closed in 1962, Nord fled to Maui. So the gas house is closed. Eric Nord Big Daddy is gone. Now we can talk about the Venice West, the two men who represent both sides of the West Coast beat movement, and the book that documented the scene, Holy Barbarians. I've never heard of this book. Should I have? I mean, I knew about it. I never read it because I knew its reputation. So, like, it's okay to know about it as part of, like, alley history, but I'm not going to, like, grade you. And if you read it, I would make fun of you. (laughs) I don't know what's worse, not knowing about it or having read it. Yeah, it depends how you look at wastes of time. (laughs) For all this, we start with a frustrated writer named Lawrence Lipton. Some writers are mysterious, troubled thinkers who are eloquent and thoughtful on the page, but complete messes as people. And some people want you to think that of them. (laughs) And Lipton seems to be a little bit more of the latter. He was a better hustler and talker than he was a writer, but he was a professional writer. He did write and make money from doing that. Just not an intellectual type that the Kerouac or Ginsburg were, nor was he the rough and tumble Neil Cassidy type, which was like a lot of beatniks kind of looked up to. He was a stiff and is a writer of popular items. According to John Arthur Maynard's book, Venice West, the beat generation of Southern California, where I got a lot of information from. Lipton was the ghostwriter for his wife. His wife was a popular crime novelist who I was very interested in. Her name is Craig Rice. That's her like pseudonym. Okay. But it was recognized that she was a female. She has like a good reputation as a crime writer. She was married to Lawrence Lipton at the time, and it's said that he wrote a majority, or they co-wrote it, but... There was a certain point in her alcoholism where he was writing more than her, I think. And she was sort of just like throwing the spice on top of what made her special. He was also a professional writer in L.A. penning many radio shows like Inner Sanctum, among many others. So he was like, now you got my attention. (laughs) I mean, like to me, writing crime novels and horror radio shows is top tier. I think that's like (laughs) the coolest thing, but not to Lipton, who wanted to be seen as a writer writer. Through his life, he had several careers. He had tried graphic arts and won some awards, then moved on to journalism and became a regular contributor to the New York Jewish newspaper, The Forverts. It sounds very weird. Forverts? Forverts is what I wrote down here. I hope I wrote it down right, but it says Forverts. Okay. He went from there. Forverts by verts. <laughs> so if it was 40, would it be a pervert? He went on from perverts, perverts. <laughs> he went from there to working as a publicity director for a movie theater. He had friends who were writers and intellects, but that wasn't something that lent itself to Lippin's work. Now, after marrying and working for his writer wife, he was looking into literature, like getting becoming like a writer writer. But always on his mind was sales. And if he was going to be a well-respected poet, he'd have to be marketable. Instead of learning the craft of poetry and spending years developing an authentic voice, he spent his time learning the craft of selling poetry. He wrote a book of poems released as Rainbows at Midnight, but to kind of no acclaim. After his divorce from the crime writer wife- I think that title sums up how you feel about beat poetry. Rainbows at Midnight? Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that that lost Lon Chaney movie? Uh, London After Midnight. No, Rainbows at Midnight. This is a different one. After his divorce from the crime writer wife, Lipton remarried and moved to 20 Park Avenue in Venice. He was in his 
mid 50s and was living a comfortable middle class life in a nice middle class home on the not so great but interesting side of town. Venice was a slum, sure, but a nice oceanside slum with little parks and benches and chess tables and unloved canals and interesting architecture. It was a it was a cool place to live. It's our slum. It's our slum. <laughs> if you could hang out at a slum that wasn't dangerous all the time, then it's <laughs> livable. And by the mid 50s, creative bohemian types were stirring in the area and this layabout lifestyle called to the shallow minded Lipton. Lipton started getting to know the characters that filled a new bohemian scene and started inviting them over to his home. They would all have rousing discussions about art and culture and politics and life and to read poetry and play music. Some of these bohemians were college students or dropouts, but others were veterans of World War II or Korean War. Some had walked from good paying jobs in post-war America because after everything the world had went through in the 40s and 50s, keeping a job didn't seem like the most important thing. And as odd as it is to me, Lipton fit into this mindset and for a while, he fit in with these types the way William Burroughs was the, the much older mentor type to the original beats on the East Coast. Some of the West Coast beats looked up to Lipton for the same thing. Like he was this cool older guy with a house. They didn't have a house and he was, you know, a nice guy and he just want, liked to have people over. This sounds like a cult waiting to happen. Kind of. <laughs> kind of. I mean, Charles Manson would swoop in <laughs> maybe 15 years later. He's got later. this ranch. He's kind of small, but I like him. <laughs> He's small, but wiry, like a rat. Lipton was a smart guy. He was a smart guy. It's undeniable. He was a smart guy and he was a writer and they respected him and he was he was in awe of these young bohemians and they to an extent were in awe of him or his at least his knowledge in the mid 50s in like 1955 56 i believe there was a poetry revolution happening which explains the seed that the beats kind of grew from and lipton was devout in his belief that poetry was meant to be read aloud reading poetry Mm. to him was like reading music but not listening to it Mm. i'm not from that (laughs) my friend i like reading poetry I, i don't like listening to poetry. I, my stance on poetry is it should neither be written nor spoken. <laughs> <laughs> Come back when it's a novel. Come back when it's a comic strip. Come back when it's a rap song. Poetry has never seemed cool to write, but there's that movie Patterson with Adam Driver, and I thought, God damn, I'd love to be a bus driver poet. He wasn't the only one that thought this about poetry needing to be read aloud. This was part of the belief of the poetry revolution. Some of the young artists and writers hanging around Lipton were, for example, there was artist Wally Berman, poet and painter Tony Scabella, poet Kenneth Rexroth, and the most prolific of the bunch, bearded, brooding artist and poet and boxcar loader Stuart Perkoff. I don't know. I've never heard any of these names before in my life. I'm teaching you. This is a teaching moment. (laughs) But I like being one step ahead of you. (laughs) That's what the dog's for. I like being leader of the pack. Ringo (laughs) is taking my spot. Ringo knows so many beat poets. Perkoff was a real deal and very much who Lipton wanted to be and wanted to be perceived as. Born in St. Louis in 1930, he split to New York, then moved to Santa Barbara and eventually down to Venice where he fell into the Venice West scene that was building. He was a frequent of Lipton's home sessions and really grew to respect Lipton and his ideas. And similarly, Lipton really was enamored by Perkoff and would be very encouraging. You're not a person who sometimes writes poems, Lipton would tell him. You're a poet. This is your calling. He was very encouraging to these young people. Around this time, late 50s, poet Allen Ginsberg releases his book of poetry, Howl, and then later his pal Jack Kerouac dumps a bunch of benzedrine into his body and types out the last couple of years of his life, releasing the output as a revolutionary novel on the road have you read on the road no i think i read like the first few pages and i was like when does this sentence end like it, it- <laughs> <laughs> i had the reaction well i read it in high school i'm overly dramatic so i read it, i'm like the sentence hasn't ended in three pages i gotta read the rest of this i i think we've talked about this before i just like i don't get poetry yeah like it just sense. does not make sense to me mm-hmm. like i if like i can, if someone's talking to me and i can hear it they switch the tone into like i am now reciting a poem yeah. like i just my brain just turns off and yeah. waits till it's over and they explain it to me <laughs> yeah like i i don't get it mm-hmm. that makes sense <laughs> I, I can't pretend to be like a poetry fan, but I've read poems that I like a lot, but it has to be like, it has to be poetry that uh, it will meet me halfway. I, I don't like being made to feel stupid. <laughs> I like It's it, so easy. If it doesn't rhyme and it doesn't talk about it, like- the Turtles a, or yurtles. I mean, there, I, I heard this one. There was a red fish. There was also a blue fish. There were a few and get other this. ones. <laughs> so On the Road comes out, howls out already, and boom, American culture changes. While Los Angeles gets occasional visits from Ginsburg, also from writer Muse, Anise Nin, who was uh, right. from Henry Miller's stories. And She's life. kind of... Um, Sexy? Oh, no, no, no. I'm thinking, who's the one who wrote The Foundation? Not The Foundation. And Rand is Fountainhead. Yeah, not The Foundation. No. <laughs> who's the one who wrote about the mule and that whole space <laughs> adventure? Yeah, Ayn Rand. That's yeah. the bad one. That's the Anais bad one. Anise Nin. 
Good one. Good one. Yeah. Good. You're you're learning feminism. There are two types of women. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, Anise Nain would come by Los Angeles sometimes. Sometimes Kerouac, Gregory Corso sometimes. Ginsburg was in with Lipton. They were pals, I guess. The vet has seen still after all this, like we are suddenly getting more visits from the big beat writers. Los Angeles is still very detached from the beat scene that is big in San Francisco. Because of that, the beat scene that grew in Venice became very insular. While lawyer Alphonse Matthews and Big Daddy Nord were the face of the gas house, it's said that the true man behind the first beatnik community space in Venice was in fact Lawrence Lipton. The scene was being referred to as Venice West, which was not Lipton's phrase, but he championed it. Whenever he'd make appearances on radio programs or anytime he'd have his voice heard, he'd be boasting about what was happening in Venice West. His salesmanship was starting the show and brother, that was a no-no in this oh-so-sincere beat scene and <laughs> one of the people who took issue with this we was, don't want to make money man yeah. i'm still I'm you're in, still hip. Yeah. you're actually going for more manson now <laughs> we don't need money man but do you have any the manson family was like the missing link the pre-man between yeah. hippies and beats yeah it, between hippies and beats there were a failed musician who had no problem stabbing yeah. people with that's it. like the bumper sticker of like the crouched over beatnik yeah and then on the other end there's the hippie smoking a doob and in between it's manson just stabbing or doing his dance wow he's doing his weird dance and all the girls are stabbing for him <laughs> But I cut you off. Who is Sorry, that? Stuart Perkoff, the very sincere poet, does not like that Lipton is so good at selling this scene or the sale of this scene. Lipton's phoniness was becoming very apparent. Anise Nin would complain and she'd go over to Lipton's house and he'd play records of people reading poetry instead of letting poets who were there read their work. Lipton was performative and wanted everyone to recognize him as an intellectual and a shaman. Perkoff was the real deal and Lipton's shameless promotion of a genuine art form turned him sour towards Lipton. That being said, Perkoff was a Bukowski type or I guess Bukowski is a Perkoff type mm -hmm. as far as making his whole life getting drunk, high, laid, and unemployed and a lifelong cycle of sad. So he's no hero either. <laughs> I don't want anyone to think like, whoa, Perkoff, what a cool guy. Can nah. we have nobody anymore then? I can't look I up- I can't have any of my toys. I can't look up to the guy who tried to commercialize beat poetry <laughs> five years after everyone lost interest. Who do I have left, Greg? The guy from The Hungry Eye I was talking about before. <laughs> Mort Saul. <laughs> <laughs> Who do I have left? Greg, Mort Saul? I swear to God, if you tell me about that article <laughs> you read about Mort Saul, I don't want to hear it. Let me have Mort Saul. Did you read it? Here's uh, a sentence that's never been said ever before. Did you hear the news about Mort Saul? <laughs> <laughs> well, unless that sentence ends with, he died 40 years ago. <laughs> you didn't Guys, read sit down. It's a Mort, Mort Saul. <laughs> you didn't read that BuzzFeed article's 10 reasons why we can't laugh at Mort Saul anymore? <laughs> This is, hey, we're not here to bash Port Saul. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Fed up with the gas house and Lipton's house, Stuart Perkoff took a big swing by purchasing a storefront at 7 Dudley Avenue. This coffee shop- Wait, would, what? Oh, sorry. Stuart Perkoff <laughs> and a friend on? bought a coffee shop and it was going to be the new beat scene. And what was the name of the street? 7 Dudley Avenue. 7 Dudley Avenue? Dudley, oh, okay. like a British person named like Dudley Moore. Okay, like Harry Potter's mean stepbrother. Like his or step step cousin. His, 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 his cousin. cousin. They're not steps. Yeah. No one's married. Well, he lives under the steps, so it's his step. <laughs> <laughs> when one of you is below the steps and one of you is above the steps, you, uh, you count as steps. So that's what a step. Yeah, is. You just have to clarify at court what it means. <laughs> I thought it was called Seven Deadly, like Seven Deadly Sins, Seven Deadly Avenue. No, that would be clever. That would be. Why would a poet come up with something <laughs> clever? That's too commercial, man. Dig it. This shouldn't make sense, man. The coffee shop would be the new gathering place for the beat scene and would be called the Venice West Cafe. The year was 1958 and the Venice West Cafe would become the place that the scene thrived in, the meeting grounds. But it would not be 1958 and would not be under the direction of Stuart Perkoff. Perkoff would only run this space for six months before being forced to sell it after the, it failed to really take off. Sell out. Perkoff would continue to write poems and be a drug addict, doing time in jail for possession, opening up a bookshop in Frisco, coming back to Venice in the 70s, and then dying soon after. That's basically some of the rest of his life. He has a book Sounds called- Sounds like he did everything a beat poet <laughs> wanted to do. Move, it, it, open it kind a bookstore of, in San Francisco go died of alcohol. I mean I'm trying to think of the other B poets that died young and like yep that's it <laughs> Neil Cassidy check Jack Kerouac check <laughs> but he has a book of poems called Suicide Room that I hear is actually pretty good if you like poetry the venice west cafe would take off after the publication of the 1959 novel holy barbarians written by 
Lorne slipped in. It was his on the road. And although I have not read it, the reviews and its reputation makes me believe it's not wholly accurate or well written. I read some modern reviews of this book. I never, I didn't find any reviews of the time it came out, but it reads like from the snippets I've read, it reads like a narcs falsified report about <laughs> being in a beatnik cafe. It's so cartoonish in its depiction of the scene and the poets and the artists who fill the space. It's said to be shallow and dull. And because it stands as one of the only novels depicting that scene at the time, it's made the Venice beat scene seem very vapid and stupid. Well. After Holy Barbarians, he became a champion of the sexual revolution, writing the 1965 book, The Erotic Revolution, an <laughs> affirmative view of the new morality. And although we both laugh and it sounds gross, it actually takes pretty progressive stance. actually pretty hot. Every sentence I read, suddenly I was just wearing less clothes. <laughs> it has a really progressive stance for 1965. He In the book, he wants to repeal all laws regulating premarital sex, make legal marriage optional, repeal all laws making homosexuality illegal, repeal all the so-called unnatural laws regarding the sexual act, make contraceptives legal everywhere and free to low-income groups, make all abortions legal and free to those unable to pay. So like not- This is so hot. <laughs> <laughs> this dude's so progressive. But wait, make marriage optional? What? Make legal marriage optional? What does that mean? Uh, I don't Isn't know. Isn't it always optional <laughs> to get married? Yeah, I, that one, I I thought I knew what I meant when I wrote it down, but I guess like- Does that mean- Optional, but like may, maybe like you have to get married. If you want to do this stuff, you have to get married. You have to be uh, a legally married okay. couple if you want to do this certain stuff. And he, I guess that is saying, nah, it's optional. You can just be like a couple. I don't know. I, this is my understanding of it. Yeah, I, I don't know it. what this swinger's talking about. He continued to write essays and articles for literary magazines. He continued writing poems and taking stances, but he was never really respected for his intellect. And he's only really known for one thing, being the father of James Lipton. Okay. <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah, dead wow. Because you, you said Lipton so many times and I was like, <laughs> got to squeeze in a James Lipton joke here. It's, yeah, it's, squeeze in a Lipton IT joke. Am I right? I kept thinking that's brisk, baby. But like, <laughs> that's not Lipton. That's Lipton, baby. You know, the, I could see that. He's got James Lipton had a very beat uh, sure. aura to him. Yeah, yeah. I could see that. Even though he wore a suit like a dork. He, he was a cool a beat guy. Beat. And <laughs> He's a sellout like his dad. Anytime he was on Conan, I thought he was beat. But also, like, he sounds a little bit like a deadbeat dad. Like, this was a child in his second marriage, uh, of which he had five. Anyways. That's Briss, baby. <laughs> uh, that's what uh, Moyle says. <laughs> that's Briss, baby. <laughs> a baby screaming. A bunch of family members being like, did he do it right? That's Briss, baby. <laughs> As for the Venice West Cafe... And he runs through the wall yeah. like the Kool-Aid man. <laughs> As for the wet Venice West Cafe, it is remembered quite fondly, although reading about it, it sounds like an, an afterthought of the B Generation coffee houses and more of a precursor to the hippie folk movement. The gas oh. house closed in 1960... What? No, again, this is uh, this is like the missing link. Yeah. Again. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's the Manson. The, the Manson link. It opens too late for one and too early for the other. Yeah. yeah. The gas house closed... It's the in, L.A. Meekly of... Uh, of podcasts. <laughs> Well, we're the L.A. Meekly of podcasts. Yeah. It's the L.A. Meekly of poetry. I mean, I guess we are kind of the L.A. Meekly of poetry. <laughs> poetry coffee houses. Yeah, it is <laughs> yeah, L.A. Meekly. The gas house closed in 1962 and the Venice West Cafe stayed open until 1966, but suffered from the same problem, noise-hating neighbors. <laughs> Many of the storefronts around the cafe remained empty. Because the real the heroes of this story. <laughs> people who hate bongos. Many of the storefronts around the cafe remained empty because nobody wanted to open up a shop next to an all-night bongo party. <laughs> They were given an eviction notice as the area slowly became gentrified and morphed into the Venice we see now, which is to say is still weird and grimy and not gentrified at all. Mm -hmm. My two favorite beatniks, however, do meet in Venice in November of 1976 at the Beyond Baroque Poetry Workshop. That is where a moody cowboy named John Doe, or I guess nicknamed John Doe, an angsty goth uh -oh. poet, Exine Cervenko, would meet and then a few years later would form the excellent band and a lot of like the way i think about beatniks and beats like that i used to think beatniks you could only write poetry but like you could be a punk band the zephyr skate team who put the z in dogtown and z boys were angsty little beatniks instead of writing poems they just would skate and surf and get high and not have jobs like that's pretty much the same thing uh, yeah that's they're free from society that's basically what beat was like we reject all the formalities of everything that became jack kerouac walked so jay adams could surf so that's basically the beat scene that happened in Venice in this, the late 50s, early 60s. Uh, memorialized my favorite in the movies that would happen. Like we talked about before, like Bucket of Blood or The Beatniks or Night Tide. We'd see like a jazz cafe and something like that. This that's is the, the kind scene? of This is the scene. That's, okay. the, that's the way I like to remember. Or that's the way I like to think about the Venice scene. Well, I've got one more for you. I don't know how that's possible. And this one can't be beat. 
correct. <laughs> so here's my last one for you. Okay. This is one, uh, actually, I don't know how familiar you are with this, but ring my bell, <laughs> Korean bell. <laughs> I forgot that his name is so similar to ring. Yeah. And when I started that beautiful parody song, he got so excited. He loves parody songs. He's a big fan of Spike Jones. Oh, no, no, he's... Picking his own what? Ringo. Whoa. So we're talking about the Korean friendship bell here. Please tell me everything. Have you been to this? No, that's not the one that we went to together. What bell did we go to together? Oh, no. Uh, part of our, our sensational viral video. <laughs> oh, which one? We did a video on Korea, remember? Yeah. So the year 1953. Okay. Millions tuned in to watch the final episode of the Korean War. <laughs> What is now South Korea is saved from the invading Northern Korean forces thanks to yours truly, America. They did it again. <laughs> A little over 20 years later, yours truly, America, is gearing up to celebrate the 200-year anniversary of their own independence. So to honor our first fight, our first fight, to honor our fight for independence, or maybe our first, who knows? And as a thank you for their own independence, the Republic of Korea wanted to do something special for the United States. Okay. They wanted to give us a giant ass bell. <laughs> what says thank you more? In this holiday season, say thank you with a giant with ass a bell giant from ass Korea. Bell. <laughs> uh, but not just any giant <laughs> ass bell, a bell modeled after one of the most legendary bells in all of Korea. Kristen Bell. Um, bell of the ball. Bell, a Lugosi. <laughs> that would be my bell company name. Uh, the bell known as the sacred bell of King Songdok. This was made, it's good to be the King Songdok. This was made in the year 771. Oh, you're forgetting a digit. You're forgetting the number two in front of that. <laughs> By King Songdok's third son who wanted to memorialize his dad's virtue that was as high as a mountain and as deep as the sea. The bell was never completed in Songdok's time and was finally finished by his grandson, who seemed to have become king by killing his own dad or by killing a guy who had taken the throne away from his dad. No, you're reading Shakespeare. What <laughs> happened in Korea? And then for the next three pages, he's just washing his hands. <laughs> There's these three women by a cauldron. I don't know what they want. <laughs> and inside of the cauldron is... Boki, or however you pronounce that uh, rice cake that I really like. It's bubbling in there. You're hoping to get a sponsorship where you get some? Yeah, I'm, yeah. Tr I'm trying to be sponsored by Big Rice Cake. <laughs> or, or just a Big Rice Cake. <laughs> so this part of the story, it was so confusing because the names are were spelled different in different ways sure. in English on different places. And I've never claimed this, this was a Korean history podcast, except that one time. Where you claimed it was a Korean history yeah, podcast. I started the episode. This is a Korean history podcast now, <laughs> and people freaked out. According to our numbers, we are only listened to in North Korea. <laughs> So they did not like to hear that. They were mostly surprised. It's actually just one person in North Korea, and you know him. He has the internet. It's he the likes one, movies. He's the one guy in North Korea who has the internet. Imagine if like the, the one thing people are allowed to access on the internet in North Korea is this show. Yeah, the translation's just a little bit off. Yeah. So they think this is like a big show, and they're like, oh, yeah. I mean, we do praise Dennis Rodman a lot on this show, <laughs> so it, it's, it's not that much of a leap. No, no, no. We much like Dennis Rodman slam dunking. Right, that's that's a reference. To <laughs> so just know that this bell, the original bell, was made in 771 mm -hmm. in honor of the dead king Songdok. The reason the king was dead before it was finished was because it took them 34 years oh, to wow. make this bell. It's over. Don't start it when I'm 70. <laughs> okay. Didn't you ever hear that bell making is a young man's game? <laughs> it's over 12 feet tall and weighs 25 tons, and it had to be a perfectly tuned body to make just the right noise so that it would emulate the home body and voice of Buddha. Okay. This is the... This is the way. This is the way. <laughs> this is what they were going for. Oh, interesting. Okay. I don't know what the home body and voice of Buddha sounds like. I got to hear this bell. I mean, uh, it makes me wonder now, is there a purpose to bells more than just like ring real loud when food is ready? Like, Well, I think maybe, uh, yeah, I mean, compared to the, the sacred bell of King Songdok and a triangle on the prairie saying yeah. the chow is coming out sure. to shoot, the chow is coming out <laughs> to shoot. There's a little bit of a difference, but it seems like in Europe, a bell is like church time yeah we got a quasimodo here god's awake <laughs> it's god's alarm clock in europe <laughs> that's why it's every 15 minutes <laughs> Yeah. Snooze. <laughs> but uh, I think in Asia, yeah, it's supposed to be meditative. It's supposed to, oh, okay. to teleport you to a different mindset, I think, rather than uh, we've got grits. Yeah. We've got grits we've and got pork grits chops. And God, yeah. <laughs> church <laughs> we've got grits and god on the top of this bell the original bell is a little and also our bell it's a little dragon named poro who's oh, cool. scared of whales so the Me bell too. the bell 
how relatable. Poro is all of us in this situation. <laughs> We're all really We don't wish them harm, but if I saw one in person, I'd be very, very scared. In Europe, they call him Pinocchio. <laughs> so the, he's scared of bells, so the bell will be rung with a giant piece of wood shaped like a whale, okay. I guess, to make him scream. I don't, I don't really... Seems cruel, but... Yeah. This bell is also known as the Emile bell because of the legend that to get the tone just right, a child was sacrificed and melted into the bell. Although they, they say that like they've done tests on the bell and there's like no child DNA in and got there. got no bones in it. How could it be? A- <laughs> boneless bell. They promised it was a boneless bell. You can dip them easier. What, what do you mean by, v- sorry, vegan bell? What's that mean? <laughs> That's Kristen Bell's sister. <laughs> so this is the largest bell in Korea, the sacred bell of King Songdok, and is now on display in the National Museum in Gyeongju. So this isn't the bell we have. This is the bell that our bell is modeled okay. after. They yeah. didn't give us the most important bell in Korea. No, I had a feeling that that wasn't just something <laughs> that they were like, eh, we're going to take an alley. I think this bell could be a star. <laughs> this bell got discovered at Schwab's. <laughs> it was- it's got a little kid in it. <laughs> Well, yeah, because it had the little kid in it, it had to take classes with Shirley Temple. Yeah. <laughs> and they tried to use it as the bell that class was over. Disrespectful. Disrespectful. So again, Korea wanted to make a replica of this bell for our bicentennial to honor both nations' hard-won independence and the veterans that made it possible. Thank you. But where should this elaborate gift reside and whose idea was this? The exact person behind this idea isn't known, but it seems that the idea to have the country of Korea commemorate the U.S. bicentennial in some way came from a group of Korean Americans in L.A. who thought it would be a nice gesture of friendship. One member of this group is believed to be the actor Philip Ahn. Ahn was born in Highland Park to Korean parents on March 29th, 1905, Mm -hmm. and is believed to be the first U.S. citizen born to Korean parents. Like, he is the first American-born Korean. This is what I read. I don't know. Okay. I I mean, it sounds like that can't be true, but then I I was like, well, when did like Korean people start coming to America? And they're like, well, uh, Korean neighborhoods started popping up in like 1915, and this is 1905, so maybe this maybe. was the first yeah, Korean person born in America. That's very interesting. It's also very interesting sometimes you can track that. You think like... A Korean was born today? Uh, the town crier yeah, going yeah, through yeah, downtown? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, that's what we have bells for. <laughs> Chow time! Yeah. A Korean's born! <laughs> they don't eat him. What but. was the second thing he said? <laughs> <laughs> is it time to eat deck? Boki, <laughs> please give us a sponsorship. I need to get the big rice cake sponsorship. There's more to this Philip Bond story as a little detour. As a kid, he was friends with another actor of Asian descent we know named Anime Wong. Wow. And they might have dated. I'm not really sure. And one day he was picking her up from a movie set when Douglas Fairbanks saw him and made him take a screen test and he himself became an actor, sometimes starring alongside Anime Wong. Wow. That's very interesting. I love like Chuck Jones is looking at it, you know, through a gate, watching Charlie Chaplin make a movie. Like it's all like I like stories where yeah, well, Douglas Fairbanks is going down the road and sees two Asian kids. Like <laughs> I got to put you in movies, and they were, and he did. <laughs> Meanwhile, uh, Philip On was also going to USC and usually had to pretend to speak broken English for movies to mm. get roles. He went on to be in over 270 movies and was also Master Can or Con again. He, he, just like just like David Can or Con, our Patreon supporter. Can't pronounce anybody's name that's spelled like that. This was the guy in Kung Fu, the like master in Kung Fu. Wow, really? That's Philip Ahn. And he was the the first Asian American to get a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Congratulations to so many things he's done. I know, a crazy... uh, um, Yeah, isn't that... To be the first Korean person born in America is a crazy title. Yeah. Uh, And I can go walk on his star tonight if I wanted to. If I wouldn't get stabbed doing so because it's (laughs) it's it's Hollywood. It's Hollywood Boulevard (laughs) on a Saturday night. Well, I mean, I wouldn't mind standing over and eating a big bowl of deck (laughs) bokey. Delicious Korean inspired American made. I mean, deck bokey deserves a, a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. And I'll put it there if they pay me. Uh, not in, not in money, in another sort of... <laughs> I don't even want money from yeah. them. I, don't, I just want rice. I don't yeah, even want I don't, it caked. I'll cake it myself. <laughs> anyway, it might have been this guy behind this whole thing. Sure. Or he was at least part of the idea to have a gift given from Korea to America. The government of Korea supported the idea of a gift, and this group being LA-based convinced them that LA was the best place for it because we have the largest Korean population in the US by far. Like, I don't know if you've seen the numbers... 
Have you checked the Korean database lately? You're kind of breaking news to me right now. I didn't know that. So it was an obvious choice, but where in LA? Griffith Park was considered, but as luck would have it, Fort MacArthur in San Pedro had just closed in 1974. So now there was all this city-owned- bell in the park by the haunted lighthouse it's not really but it's it's a little further from the haunted lighthouse okay yeah but yeah that's it that oh that giant korean <laughs> bell so yeah fort macarthur 1974 they closed so now the city owned all this empty parkland available and that was perfect for two reasons mm-hmm. one it overlooked the stretch of the ocean that u.s troops shipped out to fight in the korean war wow me. interesting okay two the fort was named after lieutenant general arthur macarthur who was the his cousin was griffith griffith <laughs> who was the dad of general douglas macarthur who is the man who helped save south korea okay. from north korea sure okay i have seen it before it's yeah, beautiful you've face. just looked up the bell yeah I, I, i'm and I'm it is of, pretty close to point Furman. like it's no nah, it's really far from there it's mm. it's nowhere near that you're wrong you're absolutely wrong korean friendship bell okay <laughs> Oh no. oh, no. I was no. talking about the Taiwanese, <laughs> the Taiwanese Bell of Animosity. It's like down the street. And then I know the street. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Sorry. I'm not I'm not sitting here trying to refute your story. I've just seen it before. Uh, sure. Yeah, you have. I mean, I, I bet you don't even know how to spell duck bokey. <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce it. I see. I know. I, I, I just want a sponsorship. I love it so much. But I'll learn how to spell when I get some. <laughs> So the area was dripping with meaning and symbolism. So a part of the land that used to be a munitions bunker that's now known as Angel's Gate Park was chosen to house this bell. Nowhere near Point Furman. Uh, Don't say nowhere near it. Nowhere near. I mean, is it even in the same city? (laughs) But now came the matter of making what is smaller than the original, but is still one of the largest bells in the world. Mm -hmm. The general form of it is the same, but what was on ours was different. The original's engraved with flower designs and celestial maidens, but ours has on each side of it our beautiful Lady Liberty, comma, statue of, <laughs> alongside a Korean spirit called a Sionyo. But on each side, these two are joined by a different symbol. On one side has the Taiguk, which is the Pepsi thing from mm-hmm. the Korean flag. Yeah. Um, the Pepsi. <laughs> on the other side is Coca Cola to symbolize <laughs> America. On one- Never the two show me. The yin and the yang. (laughs) One side has a hibiscus flower, which is the official flower of Korea. One side has a laurel branch to symbolize victory. And one side has a dove to symbolize peace. Ours weighs 17 tons, is 12 feet tall, 7.5 feet wide, and is made of copper, tin, gold, nickel, lead, and phosphorus. And a little sacrifice child. (laughs) No name. He had no name. (laughs) If they don't have a name, it's not immoral. It took a year's worth of work from a team of nine bell-making experts. And somehow they said a total of 20,000 workers had a hand in it at one point. Wow. But I, I don't know how that's like possible. Like a we are the world type of thing? Like a long line? Yeah, they like passed the hammer yeah. past 19,999 people and one guy did the job. They counted backwards each one. <laughs> how many Korean bell-makers does it take to construct a beautiful bell? 999 bell-makers. Go ahead. So it took a full year to make and $500,000. It has a wooden battering ram on a chain next to it to ring it like it's like yeah and just when and just when it was all ready for its big debut it cracked no hey our liberty bells cracked okay (laughs) we can't have two cracked bells in america (laughs) just like america right korea america we got the same problems places cracked this was even more of a problem because this bell was made in korea and they needed to ship this giant thing to la in time for july 4th 1976 just say the shipper did it yeah (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Damage in delivery. Sorry, we're not, we're not covered for that. And now they needed to make a whole new one, which they were able to get done in June 1976. Wow, really? But that was still too late to get it shipped and set up in LA in time. So instead, the first ringing of LA's historic Korean Bell of Friendship of Los Angeles happened July 4th, 1976 in Busan, Korea. Hell yeah. <laughs> it then got... It's like them breaking the champagne bottle against the yeah. ship. Oh, crap. Crap. <laughs> Did you say crap? or crap (laughs) which is better (laughs) it then got on a boat for the one and a half month journey to san pedro meanwhile they had to build this pavilion which is just as intricate and beautiful as the bell it took a team of 30 from korea 10 months and six hundred thousand dollars to build the belfry of friendship it took two weeks just to unload all the materials that they needed to make this thing if you've seen it before which greg hasn't in point foreman's like 
I mean, it's like a city. It's it's like, I mean, you might as well be in, in Canada. I mean, it's so far. I parked my car there when I wanted to go to Point Furman, but it's so far from there. Yeah. I mean, like you, you take the train to Point Furman. If you've seen it before, like I have not, Greg, uh, you know how intricate and detailed the roof on that thing is. Yeah. But it's also being held up by 12 different columns with each one protected by a different animal from the Chinese Zodiac on the bottom. So that's wow. what those 12 symbolize. The first time it was rang in LA was September 30th, 1976, when it rang 13 times, one for each of the original 13 colonies, and was officially dedicated on October 3rd, 1976. Okay. The bell's on top of this kind of bowl. So when it's rung, the sound goes down into the bowl and then reflected back up and that little dragon who's afraid of whales filters out on the top a tone that humans can't hear wow and the whole thing gives it this like like a pulsating heartbeat wow. sort of thing but whales can hear it it's it's it makes whales really randy <laughs> when it's mating season yeah boy oh boy don't boy, go this, near the ocean uh that splashing is weird caution first row may get wet er <laughs> So there's a few things that were added to the surrounding area over the years, like a tree planted by Korea's fifth president, Chun Du Hwan, during mm -hmm. his first U.S. visit on January 29th, 1981. Cool. There's also two Jongseong totems leading up to it to protect the area from evil. They're like faces, okay. like totem poles with faces on it. These were hand carved by an artist named Kim Jong Hyung, uh -huh. uh, who is apparently a huge deal in Korea and has made sculptures for U.S. presidents and the Queen of England. Oh, God great. rest her merry mm -hmm. soul. God, we lost her too soon. <laughs> So young. <laughs> so much life ahead of her. I mean, lizard people live to be like 300. A plaque near the bell says, in striving to preserve freedom, the United States and the Republic of Korea are inseparable allies linked by ties forged in blood. This is a fraternity. Don't bring that up around the baby in the bell. <laughs> uh, this is a fraternity of mutual trust, which shall remain forever unchanged. May this bell ring and sound forth the hope and resolve of our two nations in their common devotion to enduring prosperity, liberty, and peace. It's a Los Angeles historical cultural monument, but it's also been referred to as the West Coast Statue of Liberty, which it really is. Like a, yeah. It's a monument overlooking a major ocean on the coast of the United States. This one given by Korea instead of France, but for the same reason. Yeah. Like you help, we helped each other with our independence. Here is a token of our everlasting friendship. Yeah. It's weird to think about. It is. It's yeah. our Statue of Liberty. It's pretty cool. But LA really doesn't know how to treat its presence. So by the early 2000s, the whole pavilion was looking pretty run down. There's graffiti on the inside of the bell. And during one of the ringings, part of the chain holding the giant battering ram fell off and oh, no. could no longer be used. In response, in 2006, a guy named Ernest Lee started the Korean Friendship Bell Preservation Committee to figure out a way to restore the bell to its glory. Problem was, there was nobody in LA who knew how to fix a giant bell. <laughs> like, why would we need yeah. to? We have like three bells at the mission and those have been decommissioned. Those have not been in use for 200 years. They were completely at a loss for years of what, like, how do we fix this? Who knows how to fix this? Until one day. One of the committee members had brought a Buddhist magazine back from Korea on a trip and threw it on the coffee table of their office. And there it sat for four years <laughs> until 2012, when somebody did the unthinkable and read an old magazine sitting at an office table <laughs> and saw inside it an ad for a company in Korea who advertised that they were the manufacturer of the Korean Bell of Friendship in L.A. So... <laughs> I was actually looking for the uh, search and find, but I was thinking of Highlights magazine. That was yeah, the yeah. problem. But I found that. Is that something? <laughs> yeah. If Highlights can be sponsored by Duck Bokey, <laughs> then certainly we can. <laughs> Someone please tell me how to pronounce, like, uh, record yourself properly pronouncing that because yeah. I, I just have to point and say, gimme whenever I'm at a Korean place. And, and they usually to, don't like that. No, they don't like it. No. Because I first I snap at them and then I point and say, gimme. I snap and I say, no tip. No, well, that's what my that's what my uh, shirt says. My bib says that whenever <laughs> I go to a restaurant. Uh, so they immediately contacted this company and found that only one of the original bell makers was still alive. It wasn't quite up to the task of flying all the way to L.A. and repairing a giant forty-year-old bell. Fortunately, he had an apprentice named Chai Dong Hei who was ready and willing to do that. He flew in with two teams: one for the technical stuff, one for the artistic stuff, and a hundred days and three hundred thousand dollars paid for by Korea. Later, the bell was back to his original glory. His, its, original, its glory. original glory. As he left, he said, the biggest concern I have is that after I repair the bell, the birds will come in and poop on it again. 
And with those melancholy words, he was whisked away to Korea and the bell was up and running. Today, the bell is rung five times a year. You can go July 4th for Independence Day, August 15th for National Liberation Day of Korea, Mm -hmm. New Year's Eve, January 13th for Korean American Day, and September 17th to kick off everyone's favorite holiday, Constitution Week. Hell yeah. Each time, it's rung 33 times, 32 for every possible direction on the compass and a 33rd time to return you back to the center of balance. There is also a maintenance ring on the first Saturday of every month. So get there on one of those days before the beautiful sounds are muffled forever by the fecal matter of seabirds. And nobody's coming to clean it this time. We're on our own. Boy, I'm not touching it. I'm going only when it's covered in bird feces. (laughs) Check your phone. It's almost like they're close, huh? The little screenshot. Oh, that's really from the far. Map. No, yeah, that's Greg real sent close. Me, Greg sent me a screenshot I'm on the map this. of how close they are. Anyone who follows me on... Uh, is this map to scale? <laughs> or did you just like do a diorama? Because that's pretty far away. I've, France seems like it's right next to whatever's next to France. So I mean, Yeah, on this same map of Point Furman and the Korean Friendship Bell, you can also see Tierra del Fuego. <laughs> so it doesn't make any sense to me. But yeah, that's the Korean Friendship Bell. I thought it was... A, as I was delving more and more into it i was like this is a really sweet story yeah, it is. This, yeah. is, this is a good sign of friendship between two countries that have a good relationship mm-hmm. it's nice it's yeah. it's very nice that i'm very we have interested that. in kenneth no philip on philip on thank you. you're thinking of kenneth han i'm thinking kenneth han <laughs> philip on yeah you're thinking of korean famous korean american kenneth han kenneth han and it's re- like i i've been there you haven't been anywhere near it but it's it's a really beautiful bell i'd love to go hear it rung yeah i, I like someone to ring my bell yeah <laughs> We should probably go and hang out and walk to Point Farm and when it's done. What do I have? Like a year vacation? <laughs> what, what is this? The Iditarod? I can't. Well, I didn't know the Appalachian Trail covers both <laughs> of them. That's some of the things that the 30s to the 70s, right there. Some things that happened in alley history, yeah. and there's no. I like to think there's no cohesive tie, but there probably is something that links all the three The cohesive of these. tie is that it was all in the junk drawer all along. Mm-hmm. That's a few stories we just had to get out of our system. Yeah. Like a boxer who just needs to punch something. We got to get this history out. A couple of beautiful bandits, a bunch of lazy well, beatniks. A beautiful bandit. A beautiful bandit and her boyfriend who had one eye. <laughs> uh, a couple of lazy beatniks almost pulled it off down here. And a big bell big, covered beautiful in bell. bird feces. <laughs> So before we get to our listener question, we've got one thing. We, we ask you to do one thing each episode. Keep it simple. Times are tough. Like we said before, if a monthly donation is too much to support us on Patreon, you can always leave a one-time donation. We haven't uh, we haven't really talked about this. You could no. leave a one-time donation. If you go to linktree.com slash LA Meekly Pod, uh, you can leave a one-time donation. Uh, one sure of the can. aforementioned one-time donations. Like we said, it's like tipping your bartender. We don't make much money off of this, and it's a lot of hard work. But if, uh, like I said before, if everybody who listened to this left us $1, our lives would literally be changed and doing this show, uh, we could do a lot more things and uh, it would be a lot easier for us to do that. Sure. Because I've seen the numbers and if everyone left us $1, like Greg, imagine what $20 a month split between two people could do for us. That That's almost a little bit of gas. <laughs> <laughs> it would be so much easier that we wouldn't have to push our cars. <laughs> but I would certainly appreciate anything that you guys can spare. And- yeah, if you can. Like we said, think of it as a tip. It mm-hmm. really helps us out. And we love everybody who's already supporting us and everybody who does doesn't support yes. us. We love you just a little bit less. Whatever numeric value separates us, that's how much less we love you. <laughs> we have a whole calculation we can do. <laughs> we, we have all of you ranked. Yeah, there's an... We have an Excel sheet where we rank all of our fans. Yeah. And then you guys will never see it. Unless you go to the top <laughs> tier of our Patreon. <laughs> For $50 a month, we'll tell you how much we love you. <laughs> so that's the one thing. Linktree.com slash Pod. You can leave a one-time donation. But we have a listener question. We sure do. So this one is from... Our old pal, Kenny Norwick. Let's just check the chart. Where is he? Oh, Oh, okay. Okay, we can answer this. He's he's doing good. Okay, so he says, you have a good friend from out of town visiting. This is a hypothetical. Yeah, because good friend, we don't have that. I mean, clearly this is a fantasy situation. My son's over here. He's a good friend of mine. (laughs) My dog is visiting from out of town. Uh, There's one place you can go. Is it a fire hydrant or a patch of grass? (laughs) So you have a good friend visiting from out of town, but only have time to take them to one place to eat out, one neighborhood to explore, and one site to see. They don't all have to be in the same hood. Where do you take each of them? This is maybe one of the hardest questions it we've is. ever been asked. Like I had to consult with my wife. Yeah. I had to my wife. I, my, my, I had to consult with my wife. <laughs> I had to talk to my rabbi. <laughs> I had to uh, this was really hard for me to do. Do you want to start with what do you want to start with? We could go one and one. You want to start with place to eat out? 
I mean, mine's one big answer. Oh, okay. Interesting. You cheated, but okay. Area to explore would be the distance between my dad's house to Dodger Stadium. The thing to do is going to a Dodger game and the place to eat is Dodger Stadium. Okay. But when you started saying the distance between, I thought you were going to say my fist in your face, but... Um... I'm not cruel. <laughs> All right. Uh, you get Explain a great view. yourself. You get a great view. You get a little bit of hiking in between the two. Okay, Elysian Park. Elysian right. Park. I was thinking of like, what, we're going to see that 7-Eleven? Like, that's what I was thinking of between your how your dad's place and Dodger Stadium. You could either go through, yeah, you can either go through uh, Elysian Trails that lead over to, and you can, I can certainly tell you everything about Portola coming along the little river right there off the 5 Freeway and looking And at, you will. You won't stop. I can't stop. And looking at the, you know, Elysian Valley and being like, yeah, we can make a city out of this. And it happening right there <laughs> below us, walking over to Chavez Ravine, talking about all the stuff that happened there to build Dodger Stadium and then watching a Dodger game which we could be like oh, I gotta hate I hate all the stuff that they they tore down this community to build Dodger and then you're like oh but the Dodgers are playing so the site is Dodger Stadium the thing to do is Dodger Stadium or going okay. to a Dodger game the site is the the Elysian Park so the neighborhood is sorry the neighborhood is Elysian, Elysian Park. Park the thing to do is the Dodger game okay. at the, and being at Dodger Stadium is also with and then I guess and eating is a Dodger dog uh, yeah eating is a Dodger dog or any of the fine uh, <laughs> and other musings yeah uh, fine concessions they have at Dodger Stadium that's a that's an interesting answer I think that's a lot of cool things right there and it's kind of centralized and you get a great one of the best views of the city other than like maybe Forest Lawn well it's interesting okay so for my site I picked Griffith Observatory kind of for sure. similar reasons to you because you can see downtown and the ocean mm-hmm. like you can kind of survey that whole part of yeah. Los Angeles from one place. And if you're willing to hike, you can see the valley too. And the Hollywood sign. I said Griffith Observatory, <laughs> not the Hollywood sign. Not the trail behind it. No, it, well, that's like a point firm in a way. But yeah, I picked that. We both had a similar idea of like, get as high as possible. Yeah, oh, I bet. And then go up on a mountaintop. <laughs> and, and Mr. Just, CBD over here, I forgot. <laughs> get really high, eat a bunch of deck bokey. <laughs> um, my neighborhood as gross as it is, and we already talked about getting stabbed on Hollywood Boulevard at two in the morning, mm-hmm. I, I want to say Hollywood because mm-hmm. there's a lot of history that you can see there that's still there. Yeah. Like the, the Chinese theater, go into the Roosevelt Hotel, mm-hmm. see shows at uh, the Pantages and the El Capitan, Amoeba's there. Mm-hmm. And there's like just old buildings and stores that have been around for a while. There's a lot to see there. Yeah. You could kind of walk to Pink's. I mean, Pink's and Charlie Chaplin Studio. That's, that's like, like closer. three no, point that's like, No, no. <laughs> You're talking about <laughs> that's like way- Hollywood Boulevard to no, Santa Monica? Or no, that's, that's like, Melrose. Yeah, that's, that's like, you could like jump there. You could hopscotch there. It's so close. It's not you like you turn Port around Furman. and your stomach, your your big fat stomach will it knock something <laughs> over at Pink's if you're on Hollywood Boulevard. It's so close to each other. You're out of your mind. No, that's you really have close. no it's directional really close. prowess like I do. No understanding of distance. You get confused by topography. Okay. I know what I'm talking about, and Pink's is right there on Hollywood Boulevard. <laughs> right, uh, I promise all people coming to visit that Pink's is on Hollywood Boulevard. Don't look up at the address. It's a lie. It's not on La Brea and uh, Melrose. Just park in Studio City and walk over to Hollywood Boulevard and Pink's. <laughs> it's just a couple of little brown patches away. <laughs> But I, I still think uh, even disregarding Pink's and Charlie Chaplin Studios was right there. Um, I still think that area is kind of because sure. I was really uh, I, I was kind of thinking like Melrose, but Melrose has gotten kind of weird and like really expensive and bougie. But yeah. like Hollywood still as as weird and gross as it is, there's still so much to see there that's like authentic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah for but sure. for my food, this was hmm. especially hard for oh. me. Oh, I guarantee that this you've been thinking about this for six days. Have. Fights have broke out between you and your wife. <laughs> That's why I'm here with you. Yes. By the way, can I sleep in Ringo's bed? I had, oh, By the way, to answer this question, I had to visit a bunch of restaurants. <laughs> My first thought was it's got to be a place where you have a lot of options. Sure. But I was, I was thinking f- the farmer's market or Grand mm-hmm. Central Market, but I don't really like the food at those places that okay. much. Like, I don't think it's really that great of a representation of food in L.A. And sure, you hate the city. That's fine. <laughs> it's cool to hate the city. A lot of people do. So it's just nice that you fit in with them. Then I was thinking of places that are like that, but are a little less sort of hip. And I, what came to mind was maybe the Wat Thai Temple mm-hmm. food market that they have in Sun Valley on the weekends. But then do you remember also for our, our hit sensational viral video, when we went to the San Fernando swap meet, it was like a Sunday. And outside on the street, it was just 
like the street was paved with taco stands. Yeah, like there were so many vendors there. And while I have not eaten at that place, I am inclined to recommend that because yeah. Literally, there was probably like 30 different food vendors on the street there. Like you, any variation of Mexican food, desserts, drinks, like they had everything there. And I think that it was like something that's almost like I've never been to Smorgasburg, but Smorgasburg? I, well, I've been to the one in New York, the real one, the Smorgasburg, which is in Williamsburg, which is why the name makes sense. It doesn't make sense why it's called Smorgasburg, L.A. Call it like not smorgasbord snack row or something like that. But uh, <laughs> like something like that, but is more like I was saying, less hip, more sure. sort of like food Local. people eat on a regular sure. basis. I understand what you're saying. Not that I don't like hip food. I love it. But you, lo like, you love all food. I love all food. Unfortunately, you love all food. <laughs> but I think a good representation of, of LA, the taste of LA is a bunch of different taco places and get some drinks, get some desserts. I yeah. think I think that'll be a good. Yeah. So yeah, that's well, welcome to spring, everybody. Uh, enjoy your Easter. Enjoy your Pesach. <laughs> enjoy your, what else is in April? April, most of 420, April. 420. Yeah, 420. You know, enjoy your cleaning out of your own junk yeah. drawers for some spring cleaning as you listen to this. We'll see you in a few weeks with some music probably, maybe. And that's been yet another episode of L.A. Meekly. Walking with easily difficulty. between the Korean Friendship Bell and Point Firm and Lighthouse. Easily. With difficulty. Quite easily. Since 2013, which is how many years it'll take you to walk that <laughs> distance. <laughs>